We all live our lives in seasons, each one with its own unique beauty and each one with its own uncertainties. We move through seasons of growth where we feel like the spiritual soil of our lives is being cultivated and where the potential seems unlimited. We also walk through seasons of doubt and despair when it's nearly impossible to see beyond our current circumstances. We experience seasons of abundance and joy when God gives us a glimpse of the fruit He's creating in us and through us. And we walk through seasons of pruning and shaping that doesn't always feel good, but that forms us into a more faithful witness to the people around us. So no matter what season we find ourselves in, how do we learn to embrace the lessons being offered to us there? How might our eyes be open to the gifts in every season? And who might we discover God to be when the seasons feel too long and too hard to endure? These may be some of the most important questions we'll ever answer. So let's discover them together. Good morning. How are we today? Good. I need all the youths in the house today to come up on stage, please, because I need a little help. Leo, everyone else, come on. Anyone else? Yeah. I'll take the, uh, the older youth as well. Uh, Julie? <laughs> She's the one that requested the song, so she has to hold it. Just hold it out so everyone can, we can hear y'all. All right, you're gonna start clapping too, so that's. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure.
mic to Carrie, please. They came in this morning. I said, you're coming up on stage. Just, you're not getting around it. Sorry. I even talked to Phil. He said, you make him do it. It's fine. Like it was yesterday, I was praying for a miracle. I was scared to have a little hope. Now looking back today, seeing all the things you've done, I can't even add them up. One, two. I'm still counting my blessings For all that you've done in my life The more that I look in the details The more of your goodness I'll find Father, on this side of heaven I know that I'll run out of time But I will keep counting my blessings and I can't count that high Now that the seasons Never last forever So God I will remember All of the reasons But my heart has to be grateful All the times you've been faithful to me God I'm still counting my blessings all that you've done in my life, the more that I look in the details, the more of your goodness I'll find. Father, on this side of heaven, I know that I'll run out of time, but I will keep counting my blessings, knowing I can't count that high. For it. 
everything. God, I'm still counting my blessings. All that you've done in my life. All that I look in the detail. The more of your goodness I'll find. Father, on this side of heaven, I know that I of blessings one just ran up on stage did you see that amen morning carrie good morning say another blessing is we've got maria back yes uh in in sickness and in health she is back yes brought back that camp cold but she's still here so it doesn't take three of us to replace her again today her her, her cold's been around long enough i think So, yeah, counting our blessings. we got a lot of blessings out here, and just being at this church is a blessing for me. So I appreciate you guys and that you guys let me do this here. Um, so we do have youth group tonight at 6 o'clock um, for our 6th through 12th graders. So come and join us for that. Um, we've got a lot coming up our next few um, Sundays. So next Sunday night, we are having an all kids game night. So Maria and I are being very brave and we are doing some fun and some messy cooperative games with our littlest all the way to our biggest kids. Uh, so that'll be at six o'clock next Sunday night. The following Sunday uh, starts August. So starting August 4th, and we've had a little change in dates. So August 4th, 11th, and 18th, we're going to do a membership class during the youth group time. So that's going to be from 6 to 7 o'clock on August 4th, 11th, and 18th. Anybody is welcome to join us, whether you're a member of the church and you just kind of want a refresher on who we are and what we believe. If you want to join the church, it's a great time to come and find out who we are and what we believe. Um, so we'll be doing that those three Sunday nights. Um, and then after that, we'll be talking about and scheduling um, a baptism time for anybody who would be interested in that. So come and join us for that. Um, we do have our uh, ladies' night out is July 31st. So that's not this week, but the following week um, at Monocles at 6 o'clock. So any of our ladies, we'd invite you to come out and join us for that. And I think we've got some other stuff that's coming up down the road, but we'll hit you with that as it gets a little closer. So... Uh, back to you, Leighton. Thanks. Y'all want to stand up one more time? We're going to do one we actually know this time that we've done before. So, And nobody has to come up and clap. Unless you want to. You're more than welcome. Oh, man. 
story Join Maria. She's she's gonna whisper at you. Come on up, everyone. I am so glad. To be back, did you guys miss me? No. no. <laughs> you saw me every day, though. Yeah. Yeah. You came up and gave me a hug, which was very nice. <laughs> so, today, we're going to talk about Isaiah. And the story of Isaiah is very interesting. And let me just kind of reflect with you guys on about Isaiah. Because God's ways are mysterious and sometimes hard to understand, but they are good. When you look at what's happening in the world with so many bad things going on, it's easy to feel afraid and discouraged. You just cannot figure out why God would let such terrible things happen. Have you ever felt like that? Like when something bad happens, you're just like, God, why did you let that happen? Now, for you guys, that could be something as simple as, God, why won't my mom and dad let me stay up late? <coughs> but I know us adults, we go through a lot more hard things. So the fact that that's hard to understand is this. God is infinite. God is always around. He's always been around. And he always will be around. That means he has no beginning and no end. He has no limits in time or space or in any way. But you and me and all of us are not infinite. Because of this difference between you and God, there are things that are simply beyond our understanding. But don't give up. When things don't make sense, choose to trust in God. Tell God that you trust him by talking to him all the time through your prayers. Even simply whispering God's name will keep you close to him. Don't get trapped in wanting to know why all the time. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been like, why? Justice, go to your room. Why? Justice, play with your sister nicely. Why? <laughs> Leo, stop playing video games. Why? No, you cannot have more dessert, Leo. Why? That was not a discussion we had last night. <laughs> so don't get trapped in wanting to know why all the time. That's the wrong question to ask God. The right questions are, how does God want me to see the things that are upsetting me? And what does God want me to do right now? You can't change what has already happened, so start with now. Trust. <clears throat> Trust in God, one day, one moment at a time. Don't worry, because he is with us. He will make us strong and help you. And that's going to sound very similar to the verse that we are going to work on today. 
So go ahead and walk to the back, and we're going to learn about Isaiah. Happy Sunday, everybody. We may just have to let my kids sit on, stand on stage for a while. How is everybody? Play drums, yeah? I mean, yeah, I know. Well, but, I don't want him to make Gabe feel inferior, so I, he is pretty good. How is everybody? Everybody good? Good week? Decent week? Any, mm, eh? Eh? Any more doctor stuff? Yeah. Okay. 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 When's your next appointment? Do you know? No. August. Okay. Okay. We'll definitely keep you in prayer for that. Anything else? Anybody want to talk about? No? Great. FCA camp this week, Monday through Thursday. Excellent. That'll be good. We'll keep that in prayer. Last year was good. There was about 21 kids that made a decision um, to let Jesus take control of their life. So hopefully hopefully that will continue and, and be a good thing this week. So, awesome. So we're in a series called The Questions of Jesus where we're allowing Jesus probing questions to, to examine our lives and, and open us up to the truth of, of his life and his teachings. Uh, the questions are, are usually uncomfortable but if we stay with them and we allow them to do their work, our hearts will they'll be opened to all that God wants to do in our lives. So today, we have a question about vision from the book of Mark. So if you want to turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark, Marky Mark. Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. <laughs> don't think that was the same guy, but Mark 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 22 is where we're going to start. It says, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then he, his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. So this is one of, of several incidents in the Gospels where Jesus is healing blindness. It seems clear that Jesus considered every human being to be blind at some level. What's more, these, these accounts declare emphatically that Jesus is the, the only one who knows that we can't see. And he's the only one who can see. The only one with, with the ultimate vision of God. And he's the light of the world, and he is determined to lead us out of our stumbling around in the darkness and, and our shared blindness. On this occasion, Jesus took the man outside the village, away from the crowd, and he touched the man's eyes. Then comes the question, do you see anything? So the man's response is, it's very telling. He says, I see people, 
but they look like trees walking around. So Jesus touches the man's eyes a second time, and, and then the man sees clearly, finally. And this incidence becomes a living parable about the, the gradual enlightenment of the followers of Jesus, both then and now. We're, we're so slow sometimes to grasp the way and the truth of Jesus. We need time to learn from him. Just like this blind man who, who needed a second blessing from Jesus before he could see clearly. We also need many touches ourselves and graces from Jesus before we can sometimes comprehend his path and his vision for us. And also this incidence is it's important because it speaks to a particular object of our impaired vision, which is people. Do we see people the way that God sees them? Or do they look like trees walking around? Maybe we need to have another touch from Jesus so that we can see them more clearly. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse uh, 35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So how did Jesus respond to the people that he encountered every day? He saw them. That may seem obvious, but I don't think we should, we should move over that too quickly. This is more than just the physical ability to, to see them. Jesus took notice of the people. When I learned to drive, we were taught about the blind spots in our vision created by the limits of the car's mirrors. Is it possible that we have social and cultural blind spots too? Are there people and, and people groups that remain distorted to us or largely invisible to me on a daily basis. Jesus also focused his attention on them. What is our attention focused on? If we're honest, the, the answer is my needs and my desires and, and my comfort. Even when we start to talk about and think about others, we still have a tendency to make sure that we're taken care of first. And the problem is illustrated by two stories from Hebrew Scriptures. In the Exodus story, when the people came to the Promised Land, Moses sent out 12 spies to assess the land that they were about to enter. Out of the 12, only Joshua and Caleb saw the bounty and the goodness of the land. The others saw only the obstacles the giants. And the problem was compounded by their, their corresponding view of, of themselves. So they said that we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. And the other story is like uh, Nehemiah when he arrived in Jerusalem. No one had done anything about rebuilding the city because there was so much rubble. And their vision was focused on the rubble, not on the task of rebuilding. So how do I know that Jesus focused his attentions on the crowds? Because he felt something for them. He had compassion on them. And it's not enough to just notice people. Jesus cared for them deeply. The Greek word for compassion comes from the word for bowels. In other words, his feelings came from the depths of his being. 
So they were deep feelings, not just this surface level pity that he felt for them. And it raises the question, when you finally begin seeing people, how do you feel about them? Do you feel indifferent? Do you feel disgusted? Do you feel contempt? Do you feel prideful? Or do you feel self-righteous or, or I thank God I'm not like them? Jesus felt deep compassion for them. Our growth as followers of Jesus, it, it won't be complete until our hearts are broken by the things that break the heart of God. I'm convinced that more than anything else, his, his heart breaks for people who are living apart from his love. Jesus saw that they were harassed and that they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd, <clears throat> harassed by the religious leaders of the day. They were weighed down by the burden of legalism, helpless against the designs of the, of the false shepherds who come only to kill, steal, and destroy. Wandering aimlessly in a, in a desperate search for life. They were in a search for meaning and they were in a search for purpose. And Jesus' love for these people led him to the cross. And even there, he expressed nothing but love and forgiveness towards them. Ask God to change your heart towards people who don't yet know him. Ask him to fill you with compassion for them. Jesus asked his disciples to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send workers into the harvest field. The religious leaders of that day viewed the crowds as, as ch chaff, something that needed to be destroyed. But Jesus viewed them as, as a great harvest to be gathered. His harvest, his field. After leading the woman at the well in, in Samaria to faith in himself, Jesus said to the disciples, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. And the question here is, do you care enough for people who don't yet know Jesus to at least pray for them? We have to start there. But be careful, because if you care enough to pray, you'll eventually have to answer God's call to be a worker in the harvest field. I'm going to end this morning by sharing seven steps that we can take to be ready when God opens up these, these opportunities for us. We're going to ask God to increase our love for people who are still on their journey to know Him. Avoid the us versus them mentality and realize that we're all in this together, no matter who it is. And I think that's going to be especially important over these next few months. We're going to pray consistently for them. We're going to develop a list. Not necessarily Aunt Susie's arthritis. This is a list of people in your sphere of influence who don't yet know Jesus. We're going to build bridges of friendship with people that have no strings attached. Be genuinely interested in their lives. Don't look at them as, as just another target, another notch on, your, on your, your, your gospel list. Spend time with them. Really, really listen to them. Commit to being their friend even if they never come to faith in Jesus. We're not just going to share our faith. We're going to show it. There's two ways. Be authentic. Be real. 
Don't pretend like you have everything together. Doing that only leads unbelievers to, to think that you're a hypocrite or that Christianity is only for perfect people who have everything together. Even if you're mentoring someone, you don't always have to seem like you have everything together. Also, show your faith by serving people in simple, practical ways. Jesus said, let your light shine before people that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We need to be ready to tell others our story. What your life was like before Christ. It's going to be stuff that maybe you're not proud of. And maybe there's some stuff that you're not proud of that happened after you came to know Christ. That all is a part of your story. That all can be part of the transformation. What was your life like before Christ? And how did you come to faith in Christ? How is your life different now than it was then? Be real and be honest. But write this out if you have to. You don't have to say it word for word, but it's good to be able to tell a story and an account of how you came to faith in Jesus. Don't embellish it. Don't make it seem bigger than it was. But make sure it's short enough that they don't lose interest also. This doesn't have to be a 20-minute story. Be prepared to explain how they can experience God's love. Try to avoid using these formulas. A guy, a guy named Bill Hybels used to use a simple gospel presentation, do versus done. Most religions focus on what people have to do in order to win the favor of their God. But real Christianity focuses on what God has already done for us through Christ. The work is completed. We just have to accept the results. And we need to take some risks to reach out to people with the good news of God's love. It can kind of feel like an adventure if you really look at it. It stretches our faith. It's a journey. Does anybody know how to dodge a charging rhino? Jim probably does. Jim, do you know how to dodge a charging rhino? <laughs> Sound like you've done this before. First, you have to be where a rhino charges. Second, you have to get in front of one, and then you dodge it. Put, yeah, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Put yourself in situations where God can show up and work in the lives of people that are trying to find Him. Sometimes we need a second or a third or a fourth touch from Jesus, or sometimes I say a punch in the face, in order to see as He sees. And this is true for the way that we view everything, but especially people they shouldn't continue to look like trees to us they are precious to God created in his image just like us and they are of infinite worth in this world and in the kingdom just like us so how good is your vision how well are you seeing people? Is it just pity? Do you just feel sorry for them and thankful that you're not in their situation? How well are you seeing the way that God sees them? And how can you prepare yourself for the opportunity that God will bring your way this week? Let's pray. Father, thanks so much.
for the opportunities that we have to worship you and to love you. The ability to wake up every morning and make a decision. Am I going to live my life for me or am I going to live my life for God? I don't know about anybody else, but when I decide I'm going to live my life for me, I have a pretty crappy day. Lord, help focus our eyes on you. What you've done for us, what you're doing for us, what our lives can be like in the future. Help us to not only find our way on the path, but Lord, to recognize others that are not there yet and to help them find their place on the path to you. I pray that you open our hearts and you open our minds and help us to see people for who they are, not as trees walking around, but as people just like us, searching for something, searching for someone, a purpose, What is the meaning of life? It's, it's to find you. It's to serve you. It's to seek you. And to help others find that way too. Thank you for the gifts that you've given us all to have the ability to help others. Lord, I pray we find those gifts and those abilities that we have to connect with others and to lead them to you in our own unique and special ways. Lord, I pray this morning for those that could not be here, both that are normally in our congregation and those in the community that are sick, that are hurting. We pray for Rose, Lord. We pray that you will touch her and that you will heal her. Help her heart to beat as it should and to be strong and to be healthy. Pray that your spirit touches her right now in the seat where she sits and that you'll be with the doctors and you'll be with the people that are caring for her and helping her make this better so that she can be healed in Jesus' name. We pray for Susan and her family. And any of the people that I do not know about that are hurting or struggling or sick, Lord, please touch them right now in the way that they need to be touched. Wrap your arms around them, comfort them, and heal them. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I forgot to turn the mic on again. Will you all stand and worship with me, please? Y'all stood up anyway. I appreciate that.